Hello, my name is Kalia Hussain, but most of you probably already know my name from this morning. Um, I would like to welcome you to Orchid Park, Combo 2056, uh, Team 2056. Um, if you have any questions about the day, where sessions are, again, cafeteria, bathrooms, just come and ask me. Um, I would like to welcome back Chris Pinto uh, for sharing the honorable from Kayla from Team 5406 will be introduced, introducing us to uh, autonomous path following. Thanks for joining us. Um, we are uh, running a workshop, so we're, it's our hope that people will program along with us, uh, that you'll have a laptop, that you'll follow along. This will be a little bit more interactive than just us talking at you. Um, talking about code for an hour and a half is not the most exciting thing. Uh, so we've got a robot here. Uh, our hope is that uh, we can chat through a little bit of code. You can write a little bit of code. You can push it onto the robot. You can try it out. Um, and our goal for the day is uh, not to uh, teach programming from the beginning or anything, uh, but we want to help the teams that are uh, writing autos, writing simple autos, to just go to that little next step where we can go from uh, an auto that might go straight based on time, and you maybe say, I'm just going to run the motors for five seconds to do a drive straight auto. Uh, we would like to move that to uh, using waypoints, where we can say, go a meter and a half. Um, and then extend that just a little bit further to go from this uh, into something where we can maybe go and turn to a particular angle and string two little pieces together to, to kind of build the stepping stones for a more complex auto. As mentioned, my name's Chris. Uh, I'm Kristen. I'm Kayla. Uh, we'll each be uh, taking on slightly different roles over the course of this. Uh, we'll be uh, wandering around hoping to help you out if uh, you need any uh, little assistance with the programming part of it. Uh, we'll be chatting through a little bit of code, showing you a little bit, um, and then kind of programming things together. Uh, so. Uh, so a quick presentation overview is the first step we would get the code set up, um, explain how it works. We use a command-based template, and we're hoping to give a quick overview of how our code is structured and so you guys can see how it works. Uh, we're going to provide a, a starter template for people to work from. Uh, there is a lot of code that's needed to just get going, um, and a lot of that's pretty easy to talk through, and it's just uh, motor IDs and similar things. We'd like to take a few moments to show you where we get those from, where these numbers come from, uh, but uh, we're going to just link you to a GitHub repository that you can download a starting point, and then we can build from there to uh, the rest of an auto. Um, so the second step we will part of the presentation will be uh, getting into a drive straight auto with waypoints, which is telling the robot go for one and a half meters and telling it to go, go for one that exact distance. Yeah, so this is our part where we're transitioning from teams that can already do something, a very simple auto, uh, just like cross a line or something like that, which is time-based, to now going to the point where we have waypoints, where we have a distance or a measured value that we can have our teams achieve. Um, and the structure of this drive straight auto is pretty much exactly the same as all the autos that you might ever want to write. We just need to add in the same thing over and over to add in a couple of new paths and a couple of new parameters. And for part three, uh, just being a little bit more complex, uh, integrating uh, multiple waypoints, so saying go forward and then make a slight turn and then uh, make another turn before you do it. It just really gets your auto a bit more complicated because of course throughout FRC, autos are not just all one path, you require multiple paths. So this is kind of the stepping point to all the other autos. Uh, we had some reasonable autos this year. Uh, they worked uh, pretty well, uh, and uh, they're based on exactly the same idea. Uh, they're just taking individual pieces, stringing them together to give you something that is more complicated. Um, and once you can do this, you can do pretty much any auto that you need. Uh, we're going to take a, a second go, a little uh, video over here. Uh, you know, Kayla's one of our, our, our programmers, and uh, we decided we'd, we'd measure our first auto in Kayla's. Uh, <laughs> so this is programmed out uh, in our code to go one Kayla. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> so define the constant in your code. Don't have magic numbers in your code. Yeah. Make your robots go one Kayla. One, two, one, three. Uh, one Kayla is defined as 64 and a half. 
Uh, but for the most part, we're not going to be just a uh, presentation. Uh, we're going to move to, to code in just a second. Uh, but just to give you a quick overview over here. Um, so the first step will be downloading the code from our repository, which is available on GitHub under our uh, organization Team 5406. Uh, if you just go to this link or just search up GitHub Team 5406, you'll find this repository. We hope you can um, go on the repository and uh, download it and just see the compiles. It's like the first step to make sure the code works. So we're going to take a few minutes. So this, this is the, the first part that we're going to just take some time and chat through a little bit of code here. Uh, so what we would like you to do is we would like you to go to the link. Uh, you can either clone this uh, via Git as a public repository, or you can download uh, the, the file. Uh, we're going to set it up, and those of you who are participating here and actually want to start to write some code, uh, we'd encourage you to compile it and try to deploy it to the robot. Uh, so our goal is that the people here will actually write some code, put it onto the robot, test it out. Yes? What do we need to compile? Uh, that is a great question. Um, so. Uh, in order to build this code, uh, you will need uh, two, three things. Uh, you will need uh, WPI lib. Um, we can download that one to just uh, pull it up. So if uh, anyone, uh, yeah, from there. Um, so if if you do need uh, some 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 links over here, so this is where we're this is the code we're going to be downloading. Um, hopefully, people do have this build environment set up, uh, but if they do not. Um, uh, WPI does provide a full uh, set of instructions, but this is the uh, item that you would want to download if you don't already have it. Uh, you'd be looking for uh, the WPI lib ISO, most likely the 64-bit. Um, it contains uh, your Java, uh, a copy of Visual Studio Code. It'll ask you to download it, um, and uh, it'll set up all of the libraries and dependencies. So it's pretty much a one-stop installer for almost everything you need, except for the vendor line. Uh, uh, and of course, if you're running a different platform, please download for a separate version. Don't just, uh, it's not Windows exclusive, you can run it with your Mac or uh, Linux machine. So we were hoping people mostly have that set up, but if you don't, uh, we'll give you a couple of moments to, to download that and to get that set up. Uh, you will also need uh, the Rev library. Um, this robot over here is uh, one of our, our kind of a test platforms. Uh, it goes by many names. Some people call it uh, Penelope. Some people call it Cantaloupe. Um, I know it's, it's, it's undergoing a bit of an identity crisis. It just got morphed from an old robot to a new robot, and it's, it's still unsure of who it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, this robot does have a, a brushless drive. It has uh, Neos on it. Um, and in order to talk to those Neos and the Spark Maxis, which are connected to, we need uh, Revs libraries. Uh, so we will, we're using Java, uh, so we would need to download the Java libraries. We usually download these offline, but there's an option to download them online as well. Uh, maybe show us where we find those links. Um, if you just search up uh, Rev Robotics library uh, download, the first link will show you the software resources that it provides. If you scroll down just a little bit to Java API, it'll take you to another page where you can download the Java uh, library from there. Excellent. And we need one more thing. Um, in order to get the odometry working well, we need to be able to know how far the wheels turn. And we get this from the Spark Maxes and the Neos themselves. Um, but we also need to know what angle the robot's pointing at. So we need a gyroscope on this robot. Um, and for us, we're using a Navex. So you can download the Navex library from, if you just go on Google and search up Navex FRC, the first result should be RoboVRIO uh, library, select the Java version. Uh, little caveat with this version, you can, if you want the offline version, you need to have a Windows machine. It will not install with a Mac or a Linux machine. So you can still install it via the online version. It's just less than ideal for most situations. Uh, Workaround for this is to get someone who has a Windows machine just to send you the files over, uh, ask for some donation in vendor desk uh, folders. But other than that, uh, just search for the Quality Labs uh, Java Navix libraries and just download the latest build. Um, so there is there are a couple little pieces of setup on each of these. Uh, we unzip them. We have to copy a few files into the right places. 
Uh, but hopefully people have uh, a lot of that already done. If you don't, we are happy to, to help as we go through as well. Uh, so, people have a set of build environments. Our next step is getting some code, or at least the starter code that we're going to be playing with for today. So, questions? So if you go to uh, GitHub, um, you can search up uh, Team 5406 GitHub first result. Uh, it'll look something like this. You'll see auto conference right here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, and you'll see the live the uh, project here. You can click on code and then this uh, download the zip repository. If you want to clone the repository as well, you can use uh, Git as well. Uh, download the zip is probably the easiest option for us to go. Uh, so we will. We'll, oh, from here we'll we'll walk through the remaining steps together. Uh, so we're going to download the repository, um, say, we'll download the, the, the zip file, uh, we'll just save it in there, there. Um, and I <laughs> don't know where there is, but we'll save it there, and uh, we'll uh, open this up, uh, as Dylan told us. Uh, so this does download the zip file, uh, we will need to uh, unzip that. Um, and then we can go and open that folder. Uh, you, you picked a, an interesting folder to put it into, uh, but anyway, probably all the way at the top. Uh, so these are our files. Uh, we can just uh, open this now in VS Code. So uh, there are two different versions of VS Code. Uh, um, there's a normal version of VS Code if you download it, and there is the version that WPI lib installs. There is a difference. There is a difference. You need to use the version that WPI lib installs. If you use VS Code for other things, it makes life a little bit more difficult, but WPI lib version works really well for WPI lib things. I do already have one. Uh, okay, so. You end up with your VS code, it's open, it's got nothing loaded in it. So we're gonna open up our project. And the easiest way to do this, honestly, is just to take the, it in your folder and you can just drag the folder over to VS code like this. Um, I assume you guys can trust us to be like, okay, it's nothing bad. <laughs> we're gonna walk through it so you have a good understanding of what there is in it. Um, so ideally, at this point, you've downloaded the code, uh, this is just a starting point. This is, all this has is enough code for Tully off on this right now. Um, so take a moment if you've gotten to this step to just build the code. Um, and it should successfully build, uh, and this is kind of our starting point from which we can we can stem from here. Uh, how are people doing? Any any questions? I'm yes. wondering if you have an evergreen configuration of Julia, I don't believe there's any on the screen or anything else in there. I mean, maybe because I haven't downloaded this library. Um, Everyone's getting a build successful. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a few moments to, to help people out uh, as they go through over here. Um, and 
And uh, we're going to take a few minutes just to walk through uh, a little bit of the code that's present here. Mostly this is just code for teleauth at this point. Uh, okay, um, how's everyone doing? Building? Can that build? Excellent. We got someone helping you guys? Perfect. Uh, so, uh, just chatting through our code over here, um, all of the robot projects pretty much have the same structure. Um, you've got a source folder that has the main code. You do need to go one level above the source folder in order to be able to build this because there are some important build files as well as your vendor library a level higher. Um, so the main structure of it is um, you run everything through your robot folder. Um, the main things you'll really see is commands. We run command-based uh, robot um, subsystems, constants, and then robot container. We'll touch upon these uh, last two a little, bit, a little bit later. But the main things is probably just code. Um, and in one sec. Uh, so uh, you'll notice that we have a team 5406 here. The example code doesn't always have a team number built in. Um, if you do end up putting a team member or an organization, uh, you do have to modify your code just a little bit to uh, change the path to the imports, as well as changing where your robot code starts. Uh, so robot code starts in main, um, and uh, we need to, to tell it uh, that it has to use the correct package, um, and then this runs uh, a robot.java. So uh, on your RoboRio, there is a, a, a Java runtime environment. Its job is to execute the main method uh, from main. And that's where all of your code starts. And then from there, it branches out however you've got it structured. So we end up from main in robot.java. Uh, we haven't really modified this in any way. Um, we've got the, the standard structure that you find in a command-based project. If you make a brand new example command-based project, you get this structure. WPI lib will fill this in for you. Um, it uses a timed robot. It simply means that every uh, packet that comes from the driver station is coming at a periodic rate, roughly once every 20 milliseconds, and it's processing information on that 20 millisecond loop cycle. Uh, we've got a few major uh, methods over here. Kristen, want to give us a quick rundown? Um, so robot init, it's um, this is all run at the different parts of the robot. So robot init runs it runs from the robot initializer. Um, the first thing we want to do when we initialize a robot is get our robot container, it's what contains all of our autonomous, our commands and autonomous commands, and try getting that, get that set up as well. So that uh, initializes our subsystems, as well as our subsystem in this case, as well as our autonomous pod. Um, next method you'll see is uh, robot periodic. This runs no matter what, regardless of whatever state the robot is in. Generally, you shouldn't put things in here, like read the mechanism in robot periodic. Shouldn't have things running when your robot is disabled. Um, in this case, we just have our command scheduler, which is running uh, always in the background. Um, it won't do anything unless your robot's enabled, so it's just it's just fine pretty much that. Um, disable limit. Uh, when the robot disables, run some code in here. Uh, disable periodic. Do something continuously when the robot's disabled. Um, these are left blank, um, left blank shows in there. Unless if you want to like put the robot into break mode or set a value to just your encoders and go once you're disabled. Uh, we do the break mode thing quite a bit. Um, sometimes we don't want our robot to coast in auto, um, and there might be some instances where we want to put our robot into break mode while it's uh, on the field. Uh, but when your robot's in break mode, it's really hard to push around. Uh, so a lot of times we disable uh, break mode uh, at the end, or, or we take our motors from break mode, and it's not an active movement. It doesn't cause the wheels to move or anything, so you can do that right when you disable. Uh, so the first bit of actual useful code is autonomous init. So this is what runs as soon as autonomous starts. So when the SMS or even your driver system tells the robot, start enable autonomous, this is what it's going to do. It's going to get the uh, selected autonomous command for whatever you're going to do. So in this case, our one ball or our one path, start straight, or our two path uh, auto is going to ask for that. And as long as it's not equal to null, the autonomous command object is created, it's going to schedule the command right once it's periodic. Uh, 
Yeah, so again, this is all code that just comes as part of the template setup from WPI Web. If you create a blank project, you get all of this for free. So you don't have to do any of this. Uh, it's not periodic. If you want to update something, like update, I might insert it right now, it's periodic. I'm just curious. Um, yeah, so depending on how you structure your code, in autonomous periodic, that would be where uh, you actually are running all of the autonomous uh, commands and updating your odometry and other things if you were running this in a purely timed structure. Um, so it's, we've moved to a command-based structure over the last few years, uh, so we don't have to use it so much. Um, tie up in it. Um, like now we're in tie up and you need, you need to set some values. So in this case, if your autonomous command is running, unless you want it to continue running after your auto is done, it's pretty normal for a for the robot to just stop working as soon as it gets some seconds left. So this line here is asking if it's not equal, if it's doing something, just cancel it uh, as soon as tally up starts. Um, same thing for tally up periodic. Um, so same thing as autonomous periodic, but it's now in tally up. Say if you want to like, do like a system check right before your match, we call that long test in it. And the general thing is, uh, make sure nothing's running while you check it. Yeah, so it's like test mode is really handy if you have a particular scenario, like a calibration routine that you want to be able to run. Uh, that's not something that you should run during tele off or auto, but you want to be able to run it uh, as its own kind of set of commands. Uh, very helpful to have. Uh, something we're looking to add more up into our code, but. Uh, we don't use right now very much. And I'm sure you can still see in the set column pattern, if there's a mint method, it's probably a periodic method. It's, they all do the same thing. It runs for once per loop cycle. Um, so test periodic runs whatever your code you want uh, every time you're in test mode. And same with simulation mint and periodic. If you're running the simulator that WPI does provide, um, you put your methods in there. Uh, okay, so from robot.java, we launched some robot container items. Uh, we're not going to go through this in nearly as much detail. Again, this is almost a, a standard robot container. The only little items that we've added in over here are a drive subsystem. By default, you just get an example subsystem, um, and we've just set that up as a drive subsystem. We're going to chat a little about that. We've set up a driver gamepad, um, and that would be just a joystick or a controller that we can drive this around with. Um, we might end up commenting that out uh, since we're just going to do some auto stuff, but this is enough to be uh, in Telia. And then you get something that's going to send over the list of options for your autos. Uh, and if you have any buttons in Telia, you can make those do something. Uh, by default, each subsystem gets its own command. And this is a default command. If nothing else is running, this is the command that's going to run. So in this case, there's a default drive command. So if there's nothing else that uses this drive subsystem, then use the default uh, drive command. Uh, if there is something else that's gonna use the, the drive subsystem, it will override this. Uh, so it's really important uh, for this to work that you successfully pass that drive subsystem or whatever subsystem you're referencing between all of the different commands that are using it. Um. If you were to uh, fully transition towards um, command-based programming, you would put your button actions, so say you want it to do like right trigger, uh, it's like spin up your shooter, uh, you would put that into trigger button loading. You just link your trigger or your button to a um, command, basically. Yeah, so command-based structure is really nice. There's a scheduler running in the background, and you have triggers. When those triggers evaluate to true, some command can be run. Uh, that trigger could be uh, the state of a button, or it could be a more complex trigger where you have a number of requirements that are strung together. So if I press these three buttons together, that can constitute a trigger, and when that's true, then we can run a command. Um, we can also have some different variations on that, uh, but uh, you can structure each little command that needs to run as its own little module, and then run them under specific conditions. It's much cleaner than having a bunch of if statements uh, to, to make your robot work. And the final um, match function you'll find in the robot container will be to stay in the autonomous command, which will just return to the value of your uh, clinical shooter that has you list all your autos available. I, I think we'll just take a second to go to the, the default drive command, uh, and then we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of an in-depth look at it.
Um, so the basic way a command works is you set you create two values. You create one um, that's used to route the actual file, so default drive by Java. These variables will be used to route it, and then you pass in the values that are in create the object of default drive. So in this case, robot container, you pass these values into these variables here, and that's what you use to route the um, to route the command. So uh, in this case, we pass in a drive type system. Um, our double supplier was a, uh, was a value of stored and a double supplier of a statement. We assign these values uh, uh, right here and we add the requirement of our drive type system. Adding the requirement is important, so not more than one system or component on the robot can use the same uh, type system at the same time. Uh, WQLib's commands will let you skip the add requirement. Um, so it'll still allow you to structure a command where you don't have all of the requirements added. Um, but that leads to conflicts and some unusual behaviors sometimes. Um, if you have two things that are trying to use the same motor, uh, we find that it doesn't work very well. Um, our advice is that every motor group should probably end up in its own subsystem. Uh, we've tried uh, various uh, approaches over time. Sometimes we call a shooter a subsystem, but that shooter might have a turret, uh, and it might have a flywheel, and it might have a hood, uh, and while you often think about shooting as one action, sometimes you want to be moving the turret while you're driving. And sometimes you want to be moving the turret while you're shooting. And those two things can conflict. So making it so that each um, subsystem is its own uh, set of motors means that you can require the turret subsystem separately from the flywheel subsystem. So you can drive and move the turret and that doesn't lock up the shooter. It doesn't conflict with the requirement of requiring the entire shooter subsystem, which might require more than one motor. So one motor group per subsystem tends to be a good, uh, a good practice. So now that you've uh, told the command what values to use, you need to tell it what to do throughout the uh, command. So we, in the execute method, you basically, you pass in whatever method you are. So in this case, we're passing in the drive type system, the method arcade drive, and we're just passing in the values of the variables forward and rotation. And we're just getting those as doubles. And then that's run every single time the schedule of calls the command, which is always because it's a default command. Okay, so just like, uh, just like you saw in uh, robot.java, where you had uh, an initialization, a periodic, uh, you get something very similar over here. Uh, you have uh, the instantiation of this entire uh, command or this class over here. Uh, you have an execute, which is basically our periodic method. Um, and then at the end, we have uh, an option to say, has this finished normally? Um, and then finally, uh, we have something that just closes out the method. At the end, once everything's done, uh, what do we want to do? Um, so in this case, this is going to run all the time. Uh, default commands can never end. It's a little, little caveat over there. So it, it, it has to be something that can always run. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a default command. It would be able to, to stop running at some point, and that wouldn't work. Okay, so this is, this is the, the, the gist of it. Uh, we'll just take one second, look at a constants file, just the general structure that we've got over here, uh, and then we're gonna dive into some of the more complicated ones. Um, so there are a lot of numbers, um, and good practice is that you don't have magic numbers in your code. So don't, don't put like a, you know, one somewhere in the middle of your code. Instead, use the variable uh, that you've defined, the constant that you've defined. Yep. So yeah, like Christian Simpson said, magic numbers are it's better than not to have magic numbers. It, it's very hard for someone later on to, like I can say for our custom Oracle base, like in previous years, it's very hard to go back and read and say, why is the random 45 here? What is this doing? Um, magic numbers are generally uh, unadvisable to have. So that's what a constant style is. It allows you to set all those numbers that are always static and never changing, put them in a style, and you can call this file whenever you need to. Yeah, no, right. It's also really easy to change this then. Um, if I need to change this PID value, it's all in this one spot. I can just go make tweaks to this number. It changes everywhere that it's used. I don't have to go and search through the, the code, find out maybe this number was used in two places. Really convenient, definitely use a bunch of constants. Uh, I think we'll take a second um, and just illustrate where some of these numbers come from. We'll just take a second to sk skim through some of them. So we've got some uh, motor values over here. We've got some PID constants. Um, we've got some other values that we use. So some limits of uh, the output range that the, the motor controllers are able to, to output. Um, the gear ratio, in this case, it's an 11 to one gear ratio. Um, so we've got that set up in our code. 
Uh, we do like to, if we can, keep the, the numbers of where these came from. We could have converted this to uh, a decimal, um, and it would work exactly the same, but it's a lot easier to read it like this to understand why are these numbers what they are. It's a lot more obvious thing. This is a jury so much once it's a one, 11 to 1 jury, so it's not as obvious if you have some random decimal there. It's a lot easier to know further on down the line, especially if you need to look like, okay, what did this robot have? Like, this is a reprogramming robot. Okay, that had a one to a, a one to one jury ratio. It's a lot easier to tell. And if you ask mechanical people, they'll probably give you like the whole numbers, and they probably won't tell you something like zero point zero nine zero nine. Um, so, uh, mathematically, 1 and 1.0 are exactly the same, uh, but in this case, we're using the number 1, and uh, 1 would be an integer, but it can also be treated as a double for the purposes of the math calculation. But here, we've divided two numbers. Uh, programs are a little bit silly sometimes, and even though the variable type is a double, if we have two integers, it'll perform integer division on them, and then only will change that to a double. So if we had an integer divided by an integer, one divided by 11, so 1.0 divided by 11.0, you don't actually need both of them, by the way, you only need one of the, them to be a, a double, um, it would actually give us the answer of zero. Um, so we need to make one of these a double or explicitly cast it to a double uh, in order for this to work efficiently. Um, we like to check kernel limits for our robot. Um, it's not advisable if you have, you have a certain amount of uh, certain amount of kernel in your robot. If you over exceed that, you knock out a fun part. So um, <laughs> better to set a value at forty. It's a little bit high for us. Even I think we usually do less. Uh, for a drive, we often get away with forty. Otherwise, for a lot of other motors, it might be twenty. Um, we usually do twenty as well. Yeah, there, there's you've only got a um, hundred and twenty amp breaker. You can briefly go a little bit above that, you might be able to peak at about 200, a little bit over 200 amps. Um, if you've got 20 motor spots and you pull the full uh, current on each one, uh, the robot doesn't work. Um, you've got lots of different budgets on a robot, weight, size, you also have a current budget uh, and you have to stay within that. Um, so there, there are two different things. One is you don't really have much more current to give. Um, so it's nice to just cap that and know the behavior um, at, at all times. Uh, the other thing is your motor is going to heat up a lot if you don't put some current limits. Um, if you let it draw 100 amps whenever it wants, uh, you'll burn out motors really quickly. Especially with salt. Yeah. Um, un under normal usage, it won't ever hit that. But when something goes wrong, when uh, you get to a pushing match, it'll draw that 100 amps uh, if you let it, and yeah. you'll burn out things very quickly. I just testify a current that one too many zero effects would be. The smaller the motor, the easier it is to burn out. Um, some other important constants, um, S volts, uh, A Z volts, and A volts are come from our characterization, which we will show you how to do later on. Uh, it helps, I think Mr. Kim does know better, more better this than I do, but it helps um, characterize and tell the CID on the drivetrain how, uh, how much power to apply. Yeah, so um, there, there are two bits to making a robot work really well. One is a feed forward, You're kind of predicting what's going to happen. Uh, and one's a feedback, looking at what actually does happen. So if we want to make the wheels spin, um, we probably want to set a speed. I want to say I want those wheels to spin you know, five times every second. Um, we can guess how much voltage we have to apply in order to make the wheel spin at five times a second. And we do that by characterizing it. And, and basically, these three variables here are trying to account for the, the underlying static friction um, how much you need to achieve, how many volts you need to get a particular rate of, of uh, uh, rotation, and also if you need to accelerate, uh, how much additional voltage do you need. So it tries to provide the, the various values that are going to allow us to make a good, accurate prediction of starting from where we are and going to where we need to go, how much voltage do we have to apply. Um, that's a good guess. It'll get us most of the way there. Uh, we would then want to go and say, now we're not exactly where we want to be, how do we come back and fix that? So once part of it is a feed forward, uh, that initial set of voltage that we put into it, and the other part's a feedback, 
looking at where we end up and trying to fix and adjust our values later on. The PIDs provide our feedback and these characterization values provide our feed forward. You don't have to make these up. Um, the WPI lib utilities will help to get you fairly close and then you can just tweak some numbers if you don't find that it's doing exactly what you want. Um, these two grams of uh, data and grams of data, uh, those are values uh, generally determined from the WPI lib group. Um, the general rule is it, it works and unless you know what you're doing, don't touch them. Right. Yeah. Or if you don't think, block this. Exactly. These are copied directly from WPI lib. They've provided them. You don't need to change. Um, Practice meters. Uh, the robot needs to know how big is it. It doesn't know how. It doesn't know anything about it. It's, this robot's face knows nothing about itself. Let me give it some personality. So we're telling it um, it is 0 0.75642 meters wide. Um, we it needs to know the values for its kinematics, which we do uh, define a line below as well. These kinematics uh, help create a chassis velocity and know how fast it needs to go and set those values accordingly. Yeah, this is also something that's experimentally determined. You can do this in two ways. Uh, you can uh, measure your track width. Um, for a square robot, that's pretty easy to do. Uh, but uh, WPI Lib, once again, very conveniently, provides a way of doing this. Uh, it'll actually take the robot and it'll spin the robot in place. Um, and it'll use the gyro that's on board, uh, together with the encoder count, to try and calculate out how big is the circle that it's making as it spins. Uh, and it uses that to figure out the track width. Uh, so this is, again, something that uh, is much better uh, determined experimentally. Run the WPI lib characterization, and it will provide these numbers. Um, so other points, um, setting your max velocity and your max acceleration is very important. Uh, you don't want your robot to go very, you don't want your robot to go very fast and auto. It's, you'll start running into area issues where something won't go right and you'll overstep your target or you'll understep your target. It's a lot easier to just say, this is as fast as you can go, don't overstep this. At the end of the day, your robot's a physical entity. You can tell it to do whatever you'd like. It might not actually be able to do it, though. Um, you know, we, it's very easy to tell a robot, you know, you can go at 50 meters per second. You're going to cross the field in one second. Uh, but the robot can't do that. And if the robot can't do that, then when you try to model its behavior in software, you think you've said, go at 50 meters per second. It's not going to be anywhere near that, and your model is very far off. So at, in that case, you can't predict how it's going to behave. So you need to know the limits of the physical robot in order to implement them well in software. Um, some other last little bits. Um, setting the drive field diameter, uh, this is also experimentally determined. Um, this is six inch wheels, but things happen and your wheels are not actually six inches. If you find that out the hard way, it's just fine in Fairfield and Auto. Um, so usually we, that's an interesting thing to elaborate with some more on the math and how we determine this value. Yeah, so for us it's pretty easy. We usually just stick a tape measure in the ground, we start at some point, uh, we display out the encoder count, and we just push the robot a particular distance. We normally go maybe about 10 feet, uh, and we're just going to push that robot 10 feet, see how many encoder counts we got, and that takes into consideration all the different little things along the way. It factors in the diameter of the wheels, it factors in the gear ratio, uh, and then we can see how big were the wheels in actuality. Uh, whether this actually corresponds to the real wheel diameter or any other uh, little inaccuracies along the way, uh, it doesn't actually matter. It just makes the end result more accurate uh, because we know that it's, as far as the robot's concerned, to go so far, we need to turn the wheels this much. That's, that's the correlation we're trying to establish. Um, most of this robot math is much happier done in meters and in seconds and meters per second than in inches or in RPM. Uh, so we just use WPI lib uh, conversion. conversion factors to do that. So 5.775 inches, it'll convert it to meters for us. Um, last little bits, um, you, the gyro, depending on how your robot set up, it can either be reverse or it can't be. Just having a nice constant there to say, is it reverse or not, makes life a lot easier. Same with um, seconds per minute trying to get rid of magic numbers. It, as much as it might seem obvious, it might not be if you're trying to read the code quickly, so if you just <coughs> seconds per minute, it makes your life a lot easier. And same with open uh, loop uh, ramp rate, that's used to say how fast from zero to full throttle can the robot move. So that, that, that's a really useful number for tuning drowning out, um, but it also introduces lag. Uh, so if you basically tell your robot that you can go from zero to full voltage instantaneously, 
um, it can pull an infinite amount of current. Uh, having some low voltage ramp rate is small enough to not really be noticeable by the driver, but at the same time is enough to just prevent those really large spikes in current draw as you switch from going forwards to backwards. If you make that number too high, though, your robot will feel very laggy. Uh, okay, so that, that's the, the, the gist of all of the, the, the normal things. Hopefully most of these uh, weren't too bad. Uh, we're going to take a few moments just to show you where some of those numbers came from, and then we're going to get into what's arguably the, the hard bit of what we've got right here, uh, which is the drive plus spin. Uh, yeah, so when we just, uh, we'll take a second, uh, we're going to just show you a couple of the characterization tools. Let's pull them up from my desktop. Or from there, sure. Yeah, let's from there. So you can open uh, this, um, the tool called SysID to the W title icon in the corner. You just click on Start Tool. Uh, you'll see all the tools available at uh, what W title just provides, and the one we'll be choosing is SysID. Yeah, tap it. Okay, so this is uh, WPI Lib's characterization tool. Uh, this is where a lot of those seemingly magic numbers come from. Um, we need to, to set up some of the, the details of this. So for instance, we're trying to characterize a drivetrain. It gives us a choice of different kinds of um, mechanisms to characterize. We're using spark maxes. These are brushless uh, motors. Um, and then we need to set up the motor ID. So we've got motor one on the left side and motor two on the left side. And then we've got motors three and motor four on the right side. Um, for us, um, one of those pairs are inverted. Um, so we're just going to invert our left side. Uh, and we need to add a second motor group, again with the same spark mask. Um, and these will be two and four. Uh, so this is a pretty common uh, setup that we, we've got. Uh, we do need to say where that encoder is plugged in. Um, by default, it's on the encoder port. There's also a data port. You can add an external encoder. Uh, or you could use different kinds of encoders, like a CAN coder or something. Um, we are using a gyroscope. We mentioned using a NAVX. You have to tell it about this. It doesn't know. Um, and we're using STI. Um, on the MXP port. The MXP port's the little port that you can, that's a little black port on the RoboRio that you can plug something into. We have a gear ratio, 11 to 1. Um, so we fill in all these numbers, and this is the basic setup that we uh, need to tell with all of those. Yeah, we can, uh, I don't know if you're connected to the robot. So in order to make this work, you have to, this actually generates some Java code, uh, and it copies it onto the robot. Uh, once it's on the robot, then we can do something with that. Okay, so this is just going to push the code that it's generated based on our configuration over to the robot. And uh, hopefully it says success somewhere at the bottom. Uh, and we can close that out. Uh, and now, in order to run this, you actually need a driver station. So you need a driver station running on your laptop. connected to the robot and characterization actually happens in auto. Um, so you do need to be in auto for this to work. Uh, and there is a bit of a sequence to making this thing magically work over here. Uh, so we'll go to client. Um, we'll connect to the, to the driver station. Once we've got that, now we're in a, at a position to be able to, to do something with this. We've got to match these values. Drivetrain, we're trying to characterize a drivetrain. In meters, and then the units per rotation. Um, so we can go back and grab our number from our code that we already know um, and see if we can get. Uh, yeah. so, so each, this is the question here is each rotation of the motor, 
how far uh, will that result in a rotation of the wheel. Uh, you don't have to factor in the gear ratio um, because it will already factor in the gear ratio for us. Um, so here we're going to take our um, 5.775 uh, inches. Uh, we need to, that's the diameter, we need to multiply by pi to give us the full circle. Um, and then we can take that, and that's how far one rotation of the wheel would be. Uh, so Christian converted that from inches to meters, uh, and then he's taken that and he's multiplying that by pi, um, and uh, he's getting 0.46. And 0.46 is how far we'll go each time the wheel turns one time. Uh, so we need to tell SysID that. You should keep a few extra decimal places. We're just running this for, for a quick little run over here. Um, and there are four things that you can run. Um, it's going to, we're not going to run all of them, but the quasi-static ones slowly increase the voltage. So we start at a very low number and we just keep on adding a quarter volt at a time. So it slowly accelerates. The dynamic ones set a high voltage right away. Um, so we're just going to run a quasi-static one over here. Um, it depends on which one you put as forwards and backwards, uh, but most likely we want to go backwards. So we're going to try and run quasi-static backwards. Uh, okay, so this tells us that we're able to run this, and to make this actually work, we need to enable this robot in autonomous. Uh, so we are going to have the robot move, hopefully slowly. Um, we enable it. It will not stop on its own. Um, you have to stop it. So the don't close your robot, don't change the lock. Yeah. So uh, okay. So the sys ID is running your uh, stop it from running any, any code that's not on the robot? Uh, it, it completely replaces the code that's on the robot. Yeah. Um, deploy it to the robot. Uh, yes. So there was a deploy step over here. You hit the deploy. It takes its own code. It completely overwrites all of your code. So you've erased all of your code. It's just got sys ID. And a little note, uh, you can't have this run forever. So there's a limited amount of space on the robot. If you have it going forever, it, or for a long period of time, it will actually start overwriting values and your data will be uh, flawed. So it's better for you just to run it for a short period of time. Is that fair? Yeah, so normally about like five seconds or so is a good value or until your robot starts complaining or until you <laughs> almost hit a wall. Um, so we'll just run it for a couple of speed over here. Um, Enabling. See how we do. Um, okay, so you can see this is moving very slowly, but it's accelerating. This is the way that you would characterize it, because you stop it over there. Um, so it's, it's gotten some values. It told us that it's gone about two meters, according to it. Uh, that seems roughly about right. Um, and it says that it's changed an angle, so it didn't quite go perfectly straight. There's nothing feeding back over here. It just applied some voltage, so it might have drifted a little bit. But it knows that, at least. Um, so if we close this, um, we can't, uh, we're not going to run all of them. Um, so, uh, do you have one? Uh, sure. Uh, select uh, and scroll down Sorry. just a tiny bit. Stop the separate project. Uh, uh, just pick one of these sys IDs. Uh, second one, maybe? Yeah. I think it's the last one is angular. Uh, or maybe it's one before that. Oh, we'll, we'll load up a sys ID over here uh, that uh, we've run previously, since we're not going to run it in this particular time. Down a little bit more, but we're going to not run it. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Uh, so this is, um, this is the, the, the result that you get after running this. Uh, you have, you can see, we had the same 0.4609. Um, we're running a drivetrain. We got some of these KS, KV, and KA values. Um, and it, it gives us some options now to, to look at some graphs to see, does this data look meaningful? Um, is it all falling in some kind of a reasonable trend? Or is, uh, do we not have enough data? Is it not something that can actually construct a reasonable uh, outcome? Uh, as well as then giving us the opportunity to do some feedback analysis here. So at the end of the day, once we choose our values here, um, we are able to get some initial starting points for our P, I, and D values. 
So for the feedback values, you're almost always for the drivetrain looking at just a, a p value. So these, these three values are for proportional. And so looking at the magnitude of the error and trying to correct based on the magnitude of the error. Um, the integral, looking at the sum total of all the errors to date and trying to correct based on that. Um, and the derivative, looking at the rate of change of the error and trying to correct on that. For the most part, we're interested in just the p-value, the proportional value uh, for something like a drive train. Uh, but this will give you a good starting point. Um, you can fill in the values here, get some starting points for the, the PID values, and then play with them a little bit if you don't find that it's doing exactly what you want. And this will get you 90% of the way there. And if you want, you can stop at 90% of the way there, and that will still do a pretty good job. Um, okay, so this is one set of things that we get some values from. Uh, I think, Christian, if you go to select, and you just pull up the most recent one of those. Uh, no, go, go try anyway. This is um, an angular characterization. So you actually see one additional number here, and that's the track width. Um, so this would have been a scenario where it would just take the robot, spin it, and then it calculated out the track width for us. Uh, we don't really worry too much about the other values for this uh, particular one. Uh, we just want the experimentally determined track width. Um, and again, that's another option type. You can have uh, a drivetrain, or you can have a drivetrain angular. We also have other options that you can try to characterize the width for it, or a uh, intake if you're running a motorized intake. There are a lot of options. It's a lot easier to get a steady value just using select. Okay. Um, all right. This, oh, is wow. why, and this is why you don't put your robots there. No. Sorry? And this is why you don't put your robots there. Yes. <laughs> Fortunately, it's much easier to just walk your robot around these days. Um, okay. Um, so. Uh, we'd like to take a second and just uh, illustrate uh, the uh, where those motor IDs come from. So you can hook up your uh, robot to the Rev hardware client here, and we get some information. Yes, you get information about uh, all the uh, spark maxes within your um, CAN bus. Um, if you're running CCRE, of course, you can use the CCRE CAN button. In this case, you're not, so spark maxes would be used at our call time. Uh, you can put some information, you can tell some information about it. It doesn't know anything about it, what motor you're using. You can put some information like uh, can ID it is, what kind of motor it is, if it's a, you can set it to a brushless motor or a bus motor, uh, if there's limits to it, uh, current limits. You can basically do everything in code, but in a beautiful graphic in interface. Um, yeah, you can also set your current limits. You can find out which motor controller it is. Uh, if you need to flash a motor controller, make the little LEDs on it blink, uh, you can do so just by clicking on the little LED icon over here. Very handy to find out which one of those motor controllers you're actually talking to. Um, and at the end of the day, we have motor controllers one, three, two, and four over here. And one and two are on uh, the left side, and three and four are on the right side. How are people doing so far? Any, uh, any questions? Moments? Okay. Uh, great question. So uh, if you go back to this ID over there for a second, Christian, um, once you run all of these four uh, tests on your robot, so uh, the quasi-static forward and backwards, those are the ones which slowly accelerate, uh, and the dynamic forwards and backwards, those are the ones that rapidly set a, a higher voltage. It'll set seven volts in this case. Um, then you can save that file. So after you've run all four tests, you can choose where to save it, and save the file. Um, and so the files that we were pulling up uh, are just saved files that we had run previously on this robot. Um, so this is just, uh, and that's the, always the procedure for SysID. You run the test, you save the file, and then you can open the file whenever you want. Yeah. Um, if you're doing like an ARM OS where you set a choice that you only have some location, is there a place you can set limits or you just start? No limits. You are responsible. You are responsible. If, your, if your turret runs into a car limit, you are responsible for that. Yeah. Um, so it, it does make it a little bit difficult to characterize some mechanisms Especially where, dynamic. yeah. Uh, so basically, you set the values really low and go really slow. Uh, Hope you don't hit that limit. Yeah. Uh, with no limits, 
no limits built in at all. It's up to you to, to look at it and, and, and make sense of it. And, and in a certain way, that's good, just because adding in encoders, adding in limits, figuring out the directions the encoders are turning just adds a lot more complexity to characterization. Uh, so it's already not that simple. Uh, lots of little steps that people have to get just right in order for it to work. Um, so keeping the barrier low is, is, is a good thing. Uh, okay, um, we're gonna spend just a couple more minutes chatting about code and then we're gonna start writing our first audit. Um, okay, so in order to abstract out the way that our hardware and our software talk together, uh, we have a subsystem. And this subsystem is that interface between the rest of the robot's commands and the actual hardware. This is the only place in the code that we actually talk directly to the hardware in each of the subsystems. So in this case, you've got a drive subsystem, and that's the thing that's responsible for getting and setting the values that are actually on the robot. Everything else will call some method in here. Uh, so when we have a command, we call a method from the subsystem to actually move a motor. Uh, we don't talk to the motors, we don't talk to the encoders directly from any of the commands or any other place in our code other than in a subsystem. So the subsystem tends to be one of the places that's a little bit tricky to write because you've gotta actually get all of the values aligned really well. So why don't we just take a quick glance through this and yeah, um, let's take it away. So you can see from line 26 to uh, 31, we create source bar to match objects. Uh, we are doing this over CAN, of course, so you would create CAN source to match objects and you just import the library from the, the, uh, the robotic and you just create these objects. We pass in, we pass in the values of our constants. So you can see we pass in, they expect a device ID and a motor type. Spark matches can be used on brushed motors, so we, we need to make systems know that we're using a brushless motor. We pass in our motor drive port and the motor type, and we do that for all four. Uh, the next bit, uh, we, we, we create some encoder objects. It needs to know, the left drive, the spark match objects are encoders. They don't know anything about the details about how things are working. You need to create those objects and you need to tell it this is what you want, I want these objects from. To the CID controllers, you need to reference the CID controllers from the left drive to see if half the value works. Uh, for differential drive, it's the style of drive we use. Um, we just pass in the main motors, we pass in our left drive and our right drive motors and just pass them in. Uh, and this is the, those key four values that we were talking about earlier. Uh, we create two uh, individual ones, one to the left side and one to the right side. The right side and the right, left side and the right side of the drive train are not created equally. They need, they, uh, the gearbox might be tensioned differently or the wheels might be different, so it's better to have two independent values than have one general value. We just pass the values we got from society into these key fours. And I think I can kind of see the logic here, but um, Claude was pointing out that um, your differential drive only wants one motor on each side, so you have four motors, right? Yes. So later, later on in set up motors, the method we call every time the subsystem is created, we tell the le the, the follower motors to follow the main uh, motor. So you pick two of those yep. two of those four of the differential drive for sure. Yep. Yep. Um, so one of the things we create a gyro object. Uh, we just tell it this is a gyro. Uh, let's say navx a, a, a hrf, and we just uh, tell what port it's using. So in this case, it's using SPI MXP port, and we create a geometry object as well. Um, so the first major bit of code that's always done whenever a drive subsystem is created is called setup motors. It does exactly what you think it does. It just creates the motors and puts all the values, the important values to it. So in this case, you can see we restore all of the spark matches back to default. So there have been more than one times where we are using an old spark max and it has some, like, some current per se and it has a soft limit in it. And you don't know there's a soft limit there and it stops, it stops spinning right away. So then that's a hard bit. It's always nice to have a default known state, and that's uh, those couple of lines take care of making it into a known state. Uh, and next, as um, Brendan alluded to, you have to just tell the left drive and the right drive follower motors to what to do. They don't know what they're doing right now, so you need to tell it follow these um, the main motors and do exactly what they do. There are some options over there for should they both spin in the same direction, should they spin in opposite directions, uh, but the way that we've got that set up is it should be identical. As well, uh, one side of the drivetrain needs to be inverted. They can't be both be staying in the, right, in the same direction, so we just tell the left side of the drivetrain, you are going to be inverted. Assuming the motors are basically all in the same direction, right? 
so we could have two different options based on that. Yeah, it, it, it's probably a little atypical to have all the motors facing in the same direction. So almost always for a drive train, you probably have something inverted, but uh, you don't have to. Um, the code lets you go whichever way you like. Um, as well, and this is where we put the, those uh, current limits, so we just pass in the, value, the constant value of 40 amps, and we just set the current limits for each of the motors uh, for these lines as well. Um, next, remember how we created the CID objects? We need to, they need to know how to value it. Currently, they have no value to return, so in test motors, we tell all the CID controllers and the encoders, get your values and get what you need to do from the main clock master. We just pass those in. Um, Next bit, um, you set some CID values. So each um, of the CID controllers you create needs some CID values. If I set them zero, they won't do anything. So you pass the CID values you got from SysID into um, the C, I, and D, and then some of them are, and then you set your output range in what port you need to use. All of these are in port one currently. You can have multiple ports though. So if you want to have a velocity based uh, drive train and you also want a position based drive train, you can have both. You just need to set it to be a port one port. Which is really nice uh, for something like a turret. Sometimes you want to be able to, to sweep a turret at a particular speed, and sometimes you want to snap to a particular location. Uh, you do need different PIDs uh, depending on velocity or position control. Um, and you can have other kinds of control as well. You can have a nice trapezoidal motion, um, and uh, Rev libraries as well as the CTRE libraries provide for that. Uh, next bit, uh, we put this open length uh, loop ramp brace as we were talking about earlier. So you just pass in the values again. Um, the next major bit would be um, setting the position and uh, velocity conversion factors. By default, the spark master is set in, I think, just random. Uh, just in revolution. Yeah. So the, most of our motor controllers, by default, they either look at uh, the values on the motor in uh, counts or in revolution. So uh, for uh, a Neo, there are 42 ticks per revolution, but the spark masters know that. Uh, and they just count a number of revolutions or revolutions per minute. There's a gearbox though between our motors and our wheels. Our wheels have a particular diameter and pretty much we don't care about the way that the motors are spinning. We care about what the wheels are doing. Uh, we care about how far the robot's going, how fast the robot's going. These conversion factors here let us set this in one location and not have to worry about it again. It basically tells the SparkMax, whenever I'm setting a value, I'm setting this value in meters per second, and whenever I'm reading a value, give it back to me in meters per second, or in meters. So the uh, position ones here are in meters, the velocity ones are in meters per second. That's why there's a divide by second for now. Um, afterwards, we call another method called reset encoder, which just sets all the encoder values to zero. It's not very useful if you have your encoder set to a thousand and a thousand whatever units it's in, so in this case, meters, that's why we can go to kilometer in the robot. Um, <laughs> And it's not very useful if you're trying to run an auto and it breaks into a double cobbler. You need to set reset those encodes every time the robot breaks the auto. Yeah, and it's not that uncommon. We, we, we do this in auto as well, but it's not that uncommon that you might put your robot on the field and you might roll it around a little bit uh, in order to get into just the right spot. Um, so ensuring that you have some ability to zero out your encoder, zero out your gyro at the start of your autos is really important. Uh, and finally, after all this, after you set all these values, um, the values actually aren't saved to the spark maxes. The spark maxes know that you did all these things, but it's not actually saved to it. So you need to burn it to its flash storage and tell, remember these changes afterwards. Yeah. This is really useful in case there's a little power blip or anything else where uh, your Rio may reset or your, your Spark Max may momentarily lose a connection. Um, this only, this code only runs once. Um, this saves it so that it remains on the Spark Max even through a power cycle. Um, so it's important to have that there. Yeah, in 2018, 2019, it was first used, uh, it was I guess fall of 2018, first yeah. used Spark Maxes. We didn't have that, and every time we would run on a field, the Spark Maxes would forget that they're in velocity mode, it would forget that they're PIDs, and it would just stop working. Exactly, yeah, it, it's those little things that you learn over time that, you know, because you set the values, it should be set, right? Yeah. But no, you actually have to burn this to the flash to make it a permanent change. Um, some other bit, a uh, little bit, um, for that, for our default drive span, we use something called arcade drive. There's multiple places you can drive your robot. Arcade drive, tank drive, uh, curvature. curvature. They all do similar things. Uh, arcade drive is our choice, our choice of driving, which is forward and backwards on the left stick and rotation on the right stick. That's essentially what uh, 
this method does, it just passes in the values of speed and rotation and tells the drive string to move every value. And the minus one is because the joystick values are actually opposite to what you would think. Uh, pushing up on the joystick uh, makes the value lower, I think. Um, so uh, it's, there's, a, there's an inversion over there to, to flip it, or it makes it negative. Um, set break mode. Um, it's very annoying to have to set manually all of your drive motors to a certain state, either with trigger code. We just have this method with a ternary in here that says, if it's true, set the brake mode, if it's false, set the brake mode, and you just set the value of brake mode to these motors. Um, get left speed, get right speed, get average speed, they just get the velocity from each uh, motor, and get average speed just adds the two together and divides by two. And again, the beautiful thing here is because we've got those conversion factors in place, it's getting that already in meters per second, and it, it's getting that directly from the spark max. We don't have to do any more math, nothing else. The spark max does no return us the value and multiply it by the conversion factor before you do that. Uh, get left distance, get right distance, just the position child from the uh, encoders on the spark max encoder. Uh, replay encoders, as I saw above, it just sets the left encoder and right encoder to position at zero. Um, get heading, it returns the uh, rotation CD. Rotation CD is how much turn, at what angle are you at in radians on the field on your way left. So it just returns a value of that from the gyro, the gyro returns in the gate and it sets it to either, this is where our gyro reverse comes into play, so if your gyro is not reversed, uh, if the gyro is reversed, set to negative one, if not one, and just either, either have a positive or negative value in between it. Yeah, the, uh, some of the gyros uh, count positive clockwise and some count positive counterclockwise, uh, and you have to make that match up with what WPI lib is expecting. Right, and so WPI lib is expecting radius? Uh, no, WPL is, is happy to get, uh, so the, the rotation 2D object um, will be in uh, native units, and it doesn't really mind, uh, so, you, so the, it's converting this from degrees. Mm -hmm. The gyroscope returns it in degrees, uh, but what WPI lib cares about is the direction of positive. Mm -hmm. um, so if you turn to the, the clockwise direction, are you going, are the degrees increasing or decreasing? Um, and uh, so you have to account for that. So for us over here, um, the NAVX provides us in the opposite direction to what uh, WPI lib wants. Um, some other minor methods, uh, reset gyro just sets the yaw or the in all positions on the gyro to zero. Uh, very useful, it sets the start auto. Output speeds, um, this doesn't feel like really can do a better job of explaining this than I can, so I'll let him continue on it, but I'll talk about speeds. All right, so in our, um, in our autos, uh, we know what speed we should be traveling at any given moment in time. Um, the the Ramsey controller, which is what we use, uh, will calculate out at this instant, this is how fast you should be going and this is the heading that you should be traveling at. And now we need to take that and get the robot to do that. So this output speed method is going to take the speed of the left side of the drivetrain, the speed of the right side of the drivetrain, and it's going to try and make those happen. Uh, what happens is we first calculate the arbitrary feed forward. So these are using our characterizations. And so these left and right drivetrains uh, are the characterization values that we're putting in. Uh, and we're calculating uh, how much voltage should we apply, just in general. If we were trying to reach whatever these speeds are, what voltage should we apply? Once we have that, we now can tell the spark maxes let's try to achieve the speed. So now the spark maxes have two things happening here. One is the speed they're trying to achieve. Um, and they know how fast it's going. So we're trying to hold a particular or achieve a particular velocity. So our control type here is in velocity. Uh, we're using PID slot number one. So there's some feedback over here. Uh, the motor, the wheels want to achieve a particular speed. We know how fast we're going. The Spark Max knows how fast we're going. It's going to try to its best to achieve the speed uh, in question. It's going to do that by having some feedback on PID1, but it's also going to use this originally calculated arbitrary feed forward. So by passing this in, we get a really close approximation of where to start before we have to do any kind of error correction. Uh, and then we're just telling it that we've calculated out the feed forward in voltage. So we're providing it a starting voltage, use this as a starting point, then use your feedback and PID number one over here to try and hold and get the correct speed. 
and do that for both the left and right foot. Uh, the last line over here um, is simply to feed the watchdog. Um, yeah. uh, so imagine you had an autonomous lawnmower and uh, you lost control of it. It just kind of went outside of range and it was driving at full speed. Well, if the last command was continue driving at full speed, it would continue to do that. Um, so we need some a little bit of uh, intelligence in there to say, if I'm not getting any commands, if I'm just have lost communication, I should stop. Um, so we've got a watchdog, and that watchdog is listening for a new signal, a new command. And you have to keep on telling it, you've got a new command. And we do that by feeding the watchdog. Um, if you don't feed the watchdog, and you keep the watchdog timer enabled, it will disable the mechanism uh, if it doesn't get fed. Um, last little bit about pink drive bolts, types of pink drive bolts. Um, after you're done your autonomous, you're following the task, you don't want your robot to code. So if just setting the voltage to the spark matches to zero volts, which is usually pretty much what this method's used for, allows us not to code things. It allows us to tell it to stop. We also pair this with brake mode usually to just ensure that it does actually come to a stop at the end. Otherwise, you find that it overshoots by a couple of inches. If a couple of inches doesn't matter to you, then uh, you don't need to worry about setting things to brake mode. But we do find that it does. Yeah. Um, OK, so I'll just skim through the last little bit over here. Um, so we do need to know where we are on the field. That's part of the whole nature of pedometry. Uh, use the position of the wheels, use the encoders, uh, and the gyroscope to figure out where we are. Sometimes we need to reset these, especially at the start of an auto, get them back to zero. Um, and uh, then we need to keep on updating the pedometry as we go through. Uh, so at the very end over here, um, after we, we zero everything out, um, in our periodic method, we keep on updating the odometry. So every loop cycle, we're going to take the new heading, the new distance, and let the robot calculate where is it on the field. Um, and this is really important for having uh, this actually work. So uh, we've chatted a lot about code that's already in there. This is honestly, if you're, if you're writing autos, this is probably where you spend most of your time trying to fix things uh, in this drive subsystem. Uh, so we're going to take a, a couple moments now and try and write uh, uh, an auto really quickly here. Uh, uh, okay, um, so uh, just in the interest of time over here, um, I think that we're going to we're going to type out uh, some of these uh, bits and pieces. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, we are going to yeah. Um, we're going to uh, let us just do a little bit of copy and paste from uh, a repository here um, and uh, kind of get to the point where we've got uh, enough code that we can start chatting a little about this. Um, just give us uh, a couple of seconds uh, to make one of these repositories public. Okay, uh, so um, just in the interest of time over here, um, we're going to grab a little bit of code. So we've got another uh, repository up on GitHub. It's uh, Auto Conference Complete. This has uh, more completed code on there. Uh, and we're just going to copy um, a drive, some drive scrape code. We're gonna take a little bit of time to chat through it, um, but we're gonna pull it up and uh, copy it, and then chat through it. Uh, so please uh, do do the same thing. Um, grab this code uh, and, and see if you can uh, follow along. Yes. So a question in the meantime. Um, so the odometry class is uh, object is super deep. Uh, does a lot of things. Is it is it new? Um, it's relatively new. Um, as in, it's been around since 
2020 at least, I would say. Yeah. Um, so uh, we've had it for a couple of years. Um, so we've been using it since 2020. Yeah, we've been using it since 2020, which is when uh, WPI Lib implemented the Ramsey controller, okay. uh, which implements uh, a, 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 the pure pursuit algorithm. So um, we, we've done audits in a lot of different ways over time, um, but uh, for us, uh, this has worked really well. Uh, WPI Lib has a mechanism to generate the path, uh, look at uh, where you are currently in the field using the odometry, uh, and then feed that back in to uh, adjust uh, your position and continually um, have feedback on your position and adjust the path accordingly. Um, so uh, it needs all those little pieces to work really well together though. It needs the odometry, it needs to know where it is, it needs to know where it's going, um, and it needs to know where it should be at this moment in time to, to get all that work. Just for example, so what you need odometry for is it just the position of the robot on the field during the tournament? Um, it doesn't have to be just the tournament. Uh, if you attended uh, Tyler's ch uh, talk from earlier in the day, um, he talked about how 2056 uses odometry throughout the match. Um, so a lot of high level teams will use that odometry not just during auto, but throughout the match in order to predict where, for instance, the hub is. So the robot can quite easily know where it is on the field. If it knows its starting position and it tracks its odometry tr throughout the match, it knows roughly where it is on the field. It gets a little bit more inaccurate as time goes by, but it's accurate enough to know, okay, I need to point my turret roughly in this direction. Um, it saves a lot of time searching and hunting for the turret if you already know roughly where it is and can get it into the view of the limelight or your camera or your machine vision system in one go. Um, so tracking odometry throughout the match is certainly very reasonable. Um, and as you look for more and more complex applications and automation, uh, it's something you would want to do. And during the start of the match, when you start your turn, could you could you configure the odometry to shuffleboard or to um, so ideally, if you've got, uh, ideally you'll set it up in your auto. So for the autos that we're looking at here, um, we simply reset the odometry to zero. Um, this is just using the odometry in the auto. Um, in terms of like a uh, square guide, you would set the odometry to wherever you are up on the field. Because a square guide matters more if you're using that to orient your control. You need to, you need to know where exactly it is on the field and how you can control the robot. Right. How do you know what position to set it to that corresponds to the direct spot that you're on the field? Sorry if that's a very no, that, that, make, that makes perfect sense. Um, so usually you have kind of fixed starting places for your various autos. Um, if you are looking to, st to continue that odometry into teleop, uh, you've got one of two options. Uh, you can either have multiple autos with multiple different starting points. So you start at position A, and when you run the auto that starts from position A, uh, you code into that what that starting point is on the field. So what the X and Y coordinate is and what the heading is on the field. And then the odometry knows where its starting point is, it can run the auto, and then at the end of the auto, it still knows where it is. Um, you've got another option, which is at the end of auto, you can take a guess at where you are. So you can say, I'm gonna start at zero, zero. At the end of the auto, I'm going to set my odometry to my expected end position. It's a little less accurate, um, but if your auto is so far off that you aren't ending in roughly the same place, then the odometry might not be that meaningful anyway. Um, and the final thing is that you could just run the auto without worrying about the odometry uh, at the end and then bring your robot to a known location on the field and zero out over there. So when we did our swerve drive, for instance, uh, we didn't worry about the odometry carrying over into teleop. Uh, all we did was at the start of teleop, we just zeroed out the, the robot's uh, heading and then we maintained that in teleop. Um, what unit does the odometer use to measure its position by? Um, that's really up to you, but by default, the WPI lib code likes meters and meters per second. Uh, yeah, it likes SI units, uh, and uh, it also provides a lot of classes to convert between metric and imperial. Uh, so a lot of robot things tend to be in inches and feet. Um, you can put those inches and feet into your constants and then just have it convert to meters per second and meters, and it's happy to do Most of the time we do write our autos in inches and just convert to meters. Yeah. And the odometry's got the uh, angle in as well, right? The odometry has the angle. You have to pass in the heading 
as well as the uh, left and right distance of every moment in time. Basically, uh, the odometry class does a bunch of integrations. It finds the little triangles to say, I was here, I've moved this amount of distance and this heading, and you can add up all of those positions over time to get a path of where I am on the field. And you can actually draw out a little heat map of where you've been on the field using the odometry. They have an education manual where they just always talk to them and say, they have a pretty good explanation of where exactly you're on the field. And there is a heat map data as well. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so we pretty much just copied over here um, a drive straight auto that we had on the other repository. Um, we'll take a couple moments just to chat through this um, and uh, get this to build. Um, and uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll move on from there. So I wonder how you create your commands to need to uh, pass in the subsystem again to the auto. So like if you weren't to tell it, if you weren't to tell the robot um, explicitly to uh, add the requirement of the drive subsystem, it would not work on. We learned that the hard way when we were finding autos the first time, using the MJI. So we explicitly need to know you are using the drive subsystem, lock this out to the auto. And the other thing is, of course, most autos are going to be more than just driving. They might shoot, they might intake. Uh, you'll have to pass in more than one subsystem. So all the various subsystems that you use in the auto need to be passed in here. Um, next, you call a method called the get a comment command. That, this is what essentially runs your auto. Um, First little bit, we reset the gyro, we reset the robot, the geometry, the gyro, the encodes, reset everything. We don't know where this robot's gonna be, it's better to just say, start fresh, and continue from there. Um, next little bit, we set the robot to break mode. Um, the robot might coast a little bit if it's not in break mode, so just have a little bit extra guarantee that it might, it'll actually stop where you tell it to stop is nice and sort of safe there. Um, we create, create some constraints. Um, if you don't tell the robot, um, can't draw a certain amount, you can't draw over the certain amount of voltage, it will just try to draw a call pulse, which is not going to be good for your poor little battery who might be killed by your auto. So we need to tell it, you're only allowed to draw up to 10 volts, but you have these uh, constants with these P4s, so that's what the S, V, and A volts are used for from uh, the characterization tool. And you also pass in your drive kinematic, and you set the value of 10 volts. So it's really not following good practice here, I have a magic number here, so. Uh, Hopefully good ideas in the code, maybe not perfectly executed. Who's uh, you say not as a zero? Just a little comment there to fix that. Uh, at the end of the day, the robot tries to calculate out what voltage it should be applying, um, and having some limitations that what it wants to do is unreasonable is necessary for the Ramsey controller. Um, this is not what's actually setting the voltages. Um, so you notice we don't have a left and a right or anything. This is there for a reasonable approximation of limits that we want to implement on the robot. Uh, next little bit, we set a trajectory, a uh, config configuration for our trajectory. The robot doesn't know how fast it should move, or how fast it should accelerate, or what kinematic it's using, or that constraint we use. It doesn't know. It doesn't know anything yet. You need to explicitly tell it use these values. So that's what we do. We create a new trajectory configurator which passes in a value. Um, Passes in how fast it should move, so in this case, max speed meters per second, which is two, uh, two meters per second, as well as max acceleration, which is 1.0 meters per second squared. Um, same with the kinematic, so that kinematic is a track width, it needs to know, the, we need to know much info about the robot, so that's what we pass a tra uh, track width for, as well as our constraint, which is the auto voltage constraint we passed about. Uh, the robot also needs to know, is it going forward, is it going backwards? We might have told it the gyro where which way it goes, but sometimes you want to go forward, and then sometimes you want to go backwards and do like a turn. So you need to tell it which way you want this configuration to turn or go. Yeah. Um, when the robot's trying to make a turn, it needs to know how much, uh, how different the wheel speeds have to be on the left and right side. Uh, and in order to do that, it needs to know the track width. So it needs to know what its turning circle is, um, and so we do need to pass that in for it to be able to generate a reasonable uh, trajectory. little bit, um, we generate a path for the robot to follow. So in this case, there's multiple ways to do this. In this case, we just tell it explicitly go forward 1.5 meters in, in the X. Uh, you can use a uh, path user, you can use some, another, another tool I found, Chief Delphi was also available. Multiple teams have different ways of generating this. Um, we prefer telling it explicitly go a certain amount of distance, just so it's easier when you're later on trying to adjust these values, you can just adjust this one point instead of regenerating the trajectory, passing in the file, loading the file, yada yada yada. Um, the X and Y over here actually correspond to the direction of the Navex, so it matters which way you place the Navex. Um, there's a little triad on the Navex 
and uh, it matters a lot more for Swerve than it does for a tank drive, um, but uh, if you ever decide to make a Swerve robot, you change the orientation of your chassis, have pity on your program. <laughs> um, but you just give them the heads up. Does trajectory generator make like sharp lines between those points? Or is it like uh, no, it, it generates a smooth uh, curve. You can pick a, a cubic spline or a quintic spline. Uh, so it'll take your point uh, and it will try to achieve uh, the uh, incoming angle as well as the outgoing angle and then draw a smooth curve between them. Um, and then it also pass in the configuration so it can it generates this path to know how fast it should move and it's important details about the robot as well. Finally, you create a Ramsey command. So the Ramsey command is essentially what tells the robot how to do things. And it's like a regular command except it just needs a couple more values. So the first thing it expects is a path. So we pass in path one, which is in case driving forward in the X 1.5 meters. This path over here that we just made. Um, next, it needs to know the position of the robot. It doesn't know where this robot is. It needs some It needs some information about the robot just so it can continue. So in this case, we just tell it, get the position from the geometry of the robot and pass it into a command. So we're just passing in a method over here. So this is one of our methods from our drive subsystem. It needs to already be written. You need to write that method, or we've written it in this case. Next little bit, you need to pass in a Ramsey controller. So those are those Ramsey Z and Ramsey Zeta values we got from Blake Taylor. Um, once again, if you know what you're doing, press the value. If not, it works. Um, you have to pass those human eyes again. It really wants to know about the robot. Well. It's not limited. It should know about stuff about the robot. Um, finally, you should tell it um, how are you going to move. It doesn't know how to put the voltages of these motors. You just need to pass in the method, which in this case output speed, so it can know how to move. And finally, for the command, you need to pass in the requirement uh, so it can lock out the drive subsystem to the command, which is the drive uh, variable we created. Yeah, um, the WPI examples actually run the PID controllers on the RoboReal. Um, so this is much less accurate in a certain sense, but it's easier and more universal. Uh, so if you run the PID controllers on the RoboReal, you can use it for any uh, motor controller, uh, but you lose some of the uh, much more rapid loop rate that you get by running it on uh, the, the motor controller instead of on the rubber reel. Do you so think in any uh, controller of the world, of the Spark Maxes, like this Velocity controller, Spark Maxes using Ramsey, or is everything done on this robot? Um, so what we're doing, so over here, all of the PIDs are running on the Spark Maxes. Okay. Um, the default example that WPI Lib provides, though, runs all of the PIDs on the rubber reel. Um, so we find that it's much better to run the PID on the Spark Maxes. Uh, you get uh, about one millisecond loop times versus 20 millisecond loop times, um, which means that your velocity uh, following is much more accurate. Uh, the Spark Maxes have a lot less latency. Uh, they're directly connected to the, the motors. They know everything and can get it as fast as possible. We don't have to transmit values back over the CAN bus, analyze them on the Rio, set some values back up. So. For us, it's much nicer to have all of the PIDs running on the Spark Maxes and none running on the Rio. Uh, there are other times when we might want PIDs running on the Rio, but they're something running a larger control system as opposed to spinning a motor. Um, so the last little bit, this is probably the most important bit. You need to tell it run the command. You're returning the method. You need to as a method overall. You need to return the values of what to do. So in this case, we're running a sequential command group, which means. We're running commands step by step. So the first step we want to do is we want to uh, reset the geometry uh, of the robot again. It's not always certain that it's going to be re it resets as soon as the method's created. It doesn't reset again once the uh, autonomous command is called. So just for that extra layer of security, um, resetting the gyro and resetting all the, the values from the robot is very is a good idea if it's a prototype auto. Uh, and finally, you just call the Ramsey command and you just tell the robot after it's done running the command, set the uh, robot drive to zero volts. Um, with everything, uh, the last thing that you tell it is what uh, sticks around. Uh, so Ramsey command and a lot of other things will end at a close approximation to something um, or with a time. So you really do want to, at the end, actually come to a stop and setting your final speed to zero, your voltage to zero, is a good way to do that. Uh, yeah, so I think, I think so this, is, this is a nice, simple one-step uh, auto. Um, we'll, we'll add the little pieces in over here. Um, we've got a, a couple, uh, we're almost at the end over here. Um, we'll just add in enough to, to demonstrate how this works and then really quickly chat through adding in a second step. 
Um, and uh, from there, if there are any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Whatever. People have questions in the meantime. So Chris is just going to add in um, a, a little bit. So, so about three lines you need to add in over here uh, in order to expose this auto now to the robot itself. So right now, we've got this command. We've added this drive straight auto. Um, for us, we now need to actually have the option of being able to select this. We need to put this in the robot container. Um, and in order to do so, we've created the drive straight uh, command over here, the, the auto itself. Uh, we are then going to pass it into our uh, sendable chooser. So we've got the, a list of autos that we can pick from. Um, and then we push that out to uh, the dashboard. Um, can we push that out to the robot and see if it, uh, if we have any luck with that? There might be a couple of the things that we, we need to add in over here. Uh, the complete working code is in the, the repository that we have. Sorry, I need the robot. I Uh, no, it's going one and a half meters, this one, um, which is, we could have made it a little bit shorter, perhaps. Um, we toss a lot of stuff onto Smart Dashboard, um, but uh, what we, we care about is at the end of the day, we've got this sendable chooser here, uh, which Christian may be able to drag on there. Uh, and right now, there's just one auto, whatever he called it, he called it drive straight auto. Um, so that's our, our default option. Um, and we'd like this to just drive straight. Enabling. Uh, all right. Uh, wow, great, great, great. Oh, oh, we have a joystick that's hard plugged in over here. Yeah. We will. Yeah, we'll put that over here. Look at Not better watchdog. Well, we'll just pull some. We'll, we'll, we'll pull up some working code over here. We hope to spend a little bit more time uh, chatting through that. Um, uh, should just download it. Yeah, do that. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll just pull up some working code over here. The exact same code that's based on this, um, just so that people can have a go through it, uh, and then we'll chat through that last little uh, item. We hope to spend a little more time. Uh, at actually uh, working with people in programming this, and we're happy to spend a little time if people do want to stick around uh, and, and do that. Uh, but we'd like to at least show you a couple of uh, working examples over here. It is the same uh, thing, but uh, hopefully joysticks don't complain too much. Otherwise, we'll just comment them out. Uh, so we're just going to download uh, the same code that we've exposed for you over here, which is the auto conference complete. Um, oh, Christian just finding where that file ends up on my laptop. Uh, you should really put it into not the full. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, so, you can use that and all that. All right. So, we're just going to open. Trackpad magic is a, is a great thing combined with annoyances of Windows uh, 11. Uh, okay, um, so we'll, uh, Christian will push this uh, over and uh, we'll, we'll take a second to, to chat about it uh, and just take a look at just how you add a second step to that and then uh, we're pretty done. Hopefully this 
runs without a uh, joystick. Um, so, I can. Oh, okay. Just hit run on it, and I'll uh, see if it, if it does a thing. Yeah. Try not to run yourself in. <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, this is a different auto that is on here, by the way. That's cool. Uh, oh, it is. Yes. Uh, we have uh, two separate autos that we had written for this. Like, why would it always have to look back? Just of what uh, a one and a half uh, meter drive straight auto usually would do. It will end perfectly on the line for us. Um, and uh, same general idea. Uh, we can extend that to a two step auto. Um, so, correcting for little robot changes, um, a two step auto might look like this. Um, so, we have a robot that's going to follow a path going to change its angle, uh, and then it's going to go backwards and change direction. So just pulling that up for a second over here in our code, uh, we'll take a second to chat through that. Okay, um, so this is almost exactly the same, uh, so we can skim through it pretty quickly. Uh, and all we've added here is a second configuration. We want it to go in a second direction, we might have some different constraints on that. Um, and in addition to that, we've got a second path. So um, our first path goes to a particular location, and then there's a second path that we introduce. It's exactly the same, a copy of the first path, just with a different start and end point. So you start your second path where your first one ends. Um, and then you can specify the start and end angle, uh, and then we just need to string them together. Uh, so if we scroll to the bottom over there, uh, we've got uh, one Ramsey command that follows path one, a second Ramsey command that follows path two, uh, and then our actual auto says reset, run the first command and ensure you stop, uh, and then run the second command and then stop. Uh, that's all you need to make uh, a, a reasonably fancy auto, um, and then you can add in some additional steps in there uh, to instead of just and stopping, Maybe you pick up a ball, um, and then you go somewhere else, and maybe you shoot that ball. And, uh, instant command starts going as soon as you instantiate it, though? Um, instant command goes as soon as you start running the auto. Um, the instant part is that you don't need to build a complete command. It just runs this method right away. Um, so uh, you can only sequence commands. So this is a sequence of commands that are running first this, then this, then this. Um, and they're going to run in order, no. but you have to have command. Um, drive reset is a method. So to make that method into a command, you wrap it in the instant command. Of uh, all right, uh, that's, that's the gist of it. Uh, we'd love to take some, some time and answer any questions that people might have. Um, and we can, we can play with, with the robot if, if there's time available as well. So when the robot moves in a curve, do you need to tell it to move in that curve instead of an L shape, or will it default to move the curve? So if you want to go from here to here, will it default to go in like this, or will it default to go in like this? Um, it will not do a sharp curve. So you've got, if you, if you had point A and point B, you've got two options of how to get there. You can draw a straight line between them, or you can do some kind of a curve. Uh, if you specifically want a curve, um, so firstly, the, what, what determines how you go between these two points is what points are in the overall uh, trajectory and what are the angles that you're starting at and ending at. 
So if you are perfectly lined up on this uh, set of points, uh, it'll just do a straight line. But if you are pointed this way and you want to get here, it will try and do a curve that, that joins them like this, a smooth curve that follows the initial angle and whatever your end constraint is. If you want to do an L, it would do a curve. Uh, you can specify a third point. So if we scroll up a little bit, um, we've got this option of having a list of interior waypoints. So we've provided a starting point and an end point, but instead of saying go from here to there, we could say go from here, end up here, and then end up over there. So we can specify waypoints in the middle. For the points in the middle, you don't specify an angle. It's just an X and a Y coordinate. So start at this X and a Y coordinate and this angle, go through all of these points as best as you can, and end up at this X and Y coordinate pointing in this direction. So if you're trying to maneuver around like a, a four obstacle, you would tell them different waypoints you'd want them to go through. Exactly. So pretty much like pick out the points you want your robot to drive through and have your robot try and drive through those points. Uh, try and keep each individual path as simple as you can though. Um, don't try and make the robot go across the entire field. If you don't have to, make one little drive path or one action. Um, it's also really expensive in terms of time to change direction. Um, if you are going forward and now you need to stop and go backward, um, it's a very, it costs a lot of time. Uh, it definitely takes like two or three seconds to do that in a lot of cases. And when you've only got 15 seconds, uh, that's an expensive move if you can avoid it. Um, other questions? Or other things that people want to, to explore or try? Yes? I have two questions really quick. So one is, what are the benefits? Because I know I've been really wanting PIDs, but mm -hmm. what is the point benefit of PID for like driving and proceeding? And like, how do you properly use it in auto and carry off? Because I struggle with understanding that. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, so there are a lot of different ways. If I wanted this robot to, to go forward, um, I've got a number of ways of doing it. I can just take a guess at some voltage and just say, you know, uh, the motors controllers have a set option. We can just say set 0.5, go 50% power, and simply try and drive. Um, every time you do that, that 50% power is going to behave in a slightly different way. Um, if your battery is a little bit more dead, uh, if there's a little more resistance, um, if your chain tension has changed, all of these things are going to affect what uh, that 50% of, of your line voltage actually means. Um, another method is to say, we've characterized it, and we're just gonna set the voltage that comes from that. And that's, that's pretty good. Um, if you know about your robot and it's characterized well and nothing's changed, then you'll get a pretty good estimate of how much voltage you need to apply to achieve a particular outcome. Uh, the problem, though, is things do change. Uh, your robot's not always exactly the same. That means that after a little while, maybe a, a wheel's worn out, maybe um, a belt is tighter or looser, uh, and you need to correct for that. PID is the correct for that part. Um, so PID, you set uh, an objective. Um, we want to achieve this, and you try to achieve it, and then the PID lets you come back and say, I didn't quite achieve it. I'm off by a little bit. Um, I need to go back and fix that error. Uh, so, whenever you're trying to achieve an accurate set point, you want a PID. So if you want it to spin your shooter at a specific speed, um, setting a voltage is okay, but a PID is really nice. Uh, some people say that uh, just continually setting a voltage and using what's called a bang-bang controller for a shooter uh, would be uh, quite effective as well, uh, and it can be, but we, we do like using a PID for a shooter as well. Um, for this, what it gives you is accuracy. Um, if you don't have a PID, every time you run your auto, you're going to get be a little bit different. Um, with a PID, you reduce that margin of error significantly, so your auto becomes much more repeatable. Any other uh, questions? Yes. Uh, we're 14 minutes over time. Okay. okay. So we we got right. we got to wrap this up. Okay. No worries. Uh, all right. But Thank you, everyone. Uh, if you